And I'd like to introduce Bill Claxton, who will kick off this e evening program. Bill is the president and co-founder of Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. He is also a co-moderator of the Acre Carcinoid Cancer Forum and is an active member, uh, participant in the World Net Cancer Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Bill Claxton. Thank you all very much for coming this evening. Um, I want to give a proper introduction to our speaker. Um, it's really an honor for me to introduce the program on Theranostics and to welcome our invited guest, uh, Dr. Richard Baum from Bad Berka in Germany. Um, Richard is the chairman and the clinical director of the Department of Nuclear Medicine and uh, the Center for PET CT at Zen Central Clinic in German, known as Zentra Clinic in Bad Berka, which is not far from Weimar in Germany. He's also a professor of nuclear medicine, University of Frankfurt on the Main, Maine. It's a river. And Richard's clinic in Bad Berka has treated hundreds of net cancer patients uh, using PRT, and it's recognized as the center of excellence in neuroendocrine tumor diagnostics and treatment. Please join me in welcoming Richard to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm participating today in the Singapore General Hospital Nuclear Medicine Update, which uh, takes place every year, the first week of March. And uh, it's my sixth time I'm here, actually, in Singapore. I recognize some faces, some patients here and uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I have uh, selected uh, for this presentation the topic of Theranostics, and I will try to explain to you what means Theranostics and what will be new perspectives on Theranostics for US patients. So uh, my lecture might be a little bit long, so if it is too long, you just stop me. But I hope you will find it uh, interesting. Theranostics was also one of the major topics of the first World Congress on gallium-68 and PRNT, which took place at our center in June 2011, with over 400 participants from 56 countries. And we have published uh, a book on that, so for those who are really interested uh, to read about these different topics and especially how gallium-68 uh, receptor PET CT imaging and PRT can help to personalize diagnosis and treatment are referred to this book. Let me first define for you what is serenostics and what is personalized medicine. Serenostics is a combination of a diagnostic test, and we are speaking here mainly about an imaging test, that helps to define the right therapeutic tool for a specific disease. The term is not specific to radiopharmaceuticals, but in fact was first used there by Dr. Srivastava, he by the way is also here today in Singapore. He named it seragnostics, but I found it a little bit difficult to Seragnostic, so we decided for seragnostics. In nuclear medicine, it is easy to understand because you can switch the radionuclide from a diagnostic agent to a therapeutic agent using the same vector. I will explain this further to you. And one of the most prominent and oldest applications is radioiodine. Radioiodine is in use since more since 70 years now in nuclear medicine and can be used for diagnosing thyroid diseases but also for treating thyroid disease. And it was used by pharma industry at the beginning of the 90s at the same time the concept of personalized medicine appeared. Now personalized medicine means the right treatment for the right patient at the right time and the right dose. 
So it's not anymore treating a specific disease, but treating a specific tumor of the patient. And this concept has been extended to what we call personalized health care. I want to explain to you what is Theranostics by these um, nice slides here. We first have to define a target in the tumor cell. And in neuroendocrine tumors, of course, our targets are somatostatin receptors. But that can be also antigens, that can be different structures. And you have to imagine that these molecular targets are like little magnets on the outside of a cell, of a tumor cell. And then we develop what we call a specific ligand, something which binds to this little magnet, like iron binds to a magnet, okay? So we inject the substance into the blood and it travels all over the body, and where, the, where there are these little magnets or receptors that bind. And when we label this ligand, we call it then a molecular imaging probe, an imaging probe because with a radio label which is fixed to this specific ligand, we can detect then in the body where it is. Okay? So it's like a key and a lock and a key bag, or how you call that. Okay? So the key bag is our radionuclide and the key goes into the lock. And then by this we can select patients. So if you look at these two images on the left and on the right here, these are so-called CT scans, computer tomography X-ray scans, which show you very nicely the anatomy. For example, the white things here are the bones, actually the, the size. And uh, you see there is a lesion here, a tumor, a lymph node metastasis. In the other case, there is a lesion here. When we now use our probe to test if our little magnets are there. You see, on the one side it is lighting up, whereas the other patient is what we call negative. He is not taking up the molecular imaging probe. And by that we can then decide if our target, if our magnets or the receptors are there, we can decide to treat the one patient and to not treat the other because it would be useless when your target is not there, it's useless. We also can use this molecular imaging probe for therapy monitoring. That means if you apply the therapy, then you can check after some weeks or months if the therapy works. For example, in this uh, animal experiment, it was working when treating a tumor with an anti-angiogenetic drug. Or we can also use as a label a therapeutic radionuclide, which irradiates the tumor, which not only shows us a tumor, but which irradiates the tumor. So, theranostics means really the combination of a diagnostic uh, and uh, therapeutic application. This is uh, the common way nowadays cancers are treated. You make the diagnosis of a patient and then you act by giving chemotherapy, for example, and then you wait some months, you give three, four, five, six cycles of chemotherapy, and then you repeat the test, let's say a CT scan or MRI scan, and then you see if it has worked or not, if you failed or if you have success. And if you had no success, you go to what we call second-line chemotherapy, or even third-line, or, or something else, okay? But it's what we call trial and error. You know from a large database, empirically, that your therapy will work, let's say, in 80 or 90 percent of the patients. But you, as an individual patient, can belong to this 10 percent, where it does not work, and nobody can predict it. When we are using um, these molecular imaging probes, then we can break the cycle of trial and error medicine. That means we observe if our probe is binding, we test it, 
and then based on this experience we act and we can predict response because uh, our uh, target is really there. Therefore targeted radionuclide therapy for example PRT has unique promise for personalized treatment of cancer because both the targeting vehicle and the radionuclide can be tailored to the individual patient. So this is uh, again explaining this uh, key and lock principle. On the cell you have the lock, that means in our case what we call GPCRS, G protein coupled receptors or the little magnets, how I call them, <coughs> or it can be antigens, for example, for antibodies recognizing breast cancer, CD20 or HER2. And then we have the ligand which binds to this target as a key. And this key can be antibodies or mini bodies or amino acids, though there are different ways how we can construct the key. And then we have a linker to the key and what we call a chelator which is like a little cage and our radionuclide, the diagnostic radionuclide, here is mentioned gallium for example, or the therapeutic radionuclide, lutetium-177, a beta emitter or itrium-90, or also other cytotoxic unit can be kept into this cage in the chelator, fixed very tight to this linker, and then go to the tumor cell and irradiate it. So one of these uh, really decisive radionuclides which we are using for imaging is gallium-68, which we studied first in 2004, and we have uh, up to now done more than 7,500 studies in patients. The advantage of this gallium generator, just very shortly, is that you do not need a very expensive cyclotron. A cyclotron is a machine where you produce these radionuclides which you use for PET imaging, and the cost for a cyclotron and radiopharmacy and so on is between 5 and 10 or 15 million investment. Okay, and you need a lot of money in the hundred thousands or even million to run this system every year. Whereas this generator is only uh, in the range of a few ten thousand of euros. And you can use this generator uh, also uh, for about a year and label uh, your keys with it. Okay, so um, that is also affordable for countries like India. That's why we had the Second World Congress on Gallium in India, and there are, meanwhile, in India, more than 15 different sites using Gallium-68 for PET-CT imaging. This is a, such a generator from a German company named ESAC, and you see these um, devices have, meanwhile, developed from a very crude stage when we started in 2004 to now... Um, industrial product and uh, they are using a so-called cassette system so you can insert in this little chemical factory a cassette where your peptide is in the cassette and when you insert it it is labeled nearly automatically by gallium and then you can you know remove the cassette and it checks the radio label peptide into you as patients so when I saw this uh, development in 2004, I made a prediction that gallium has a potential to become the technetium 99 m for PET-CT. That means technetium 99 m is nowadays a workhorse in nuclear medicine for imaging with gamma cameras. And you see that the number of studies has meanwhile increased to over uh, 1,100 per year in our department and we could do even more if we would have more imaging capacity that means more PET-CT scanner because the request is very high. Why is gallium so successful? This is shown by these images um, even after about 20 minutes or 40 minutes 
So after a very short time, you get already very nice images. For nuclear medicine people, uh, it is very decisive that you have what we call a high tumor to background, so you can recognize small lesions in the body, like here liver metastases, bone metastases, lymph node metastases. What is very important for you as a patient, you have only to come once to the department. The whole examination takes about one or two hours and you are finished, whereas with the former imaging agents, especially OctroScan, you had to come two or even three days and the imaging time on the couch was much longer and also the radiation dose was higher as with PET-CT. As you can see here, it is only three millisievert. So if you go from, let's say, uh, south of Germany to the Alps and you live at about 2,000 meters high, you also have three millisievert more. So it's just in the range of natural uh, radiation. So we have what we call fast kinetics. It's clearing very fast from blood and fast renal clearance and high tumor uptake. So just one example I would like to show you. Uh, I now call the OctroScan the old standard, not anymore the gold standard. So this was a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor which had been removed and also a single liver metastasis had been resected some time ago, but he presented with an increasing tumor marker. So in blood there are substances you can measure which indicates the disease is again there and one of these markers is a chromogranin A, the CGA which is mentioned here. So the patient was imaged with OctroScan and this is an image from the front and this one from the back and you see there is no significant uptake but when we image the same patient with the gallium you see that there is very high uptake in a metastasis here in the liver and astonishingly we detected another lesion in his stomach which was completely unknown and unexpected before but which was also proven as a metastasis of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and both lesions could be resected by the surgeon and fortunately the patient uh, is still tumor free I think this study is now more than three years so we come you know the Americans they have a wording which say nuclear means unclear you, you understand this okay so we can come from unclear medicine to a new clear medicine that's what I really like with the gallium 68 somatostatin agents and this is not only the case in our hospital but as you can see here from uh, the Peter Mac uh, Center in Australia the Peter McCallum Cancer Center uh, a patient with the indium octotide scan and a single lesion here you see whereas when you image with gallium 68 octotate you see that this patient has many many more lesions and this is of course very important for uh, this deciding on the therapy and uh, one of the most important studies came actually from the department of uh, Irene Virgolini which is now concentrating also on the slide <laughs> okay it's a very nice study because it compared gallium with indium and technetium which is another uh, radionuclide which can be used and CT and different technologies and you see that the sensitivity, the sensitivity describes in how many cases the test is true positive. Okay, So the sensitivity for PET was 97%, whereas for SPECT, another imaging method in nuclear medicine, it was just 52%, and for CT it was 61%. And the specificity, which gives you the number of patients which have a correctly negative test was 92% also for PET, so very high what we call diagnostic accuracy. Again, if you look at the influence this data have for a medical doctor, I mean, what you are doing with this data? 
you can say, okay, these are very nice results, but if I see two or three or ten lesions, it doesn't matter. I anyway do the same thing. But if you look how this additional information changed the management of the patient, you see that there was in 47%, so nearly half of the patient, there was a change in management. For example, from surgery to non-surgery, or from non-surgery to surgery sometimes, okay? Or to chemotherapy or whatsoever. So you mentioned already in your introduction that our center in Bad Berka, the Zentralklinik, is a center of excellence since exactly two years now. It was really in March this day we received it. And it was hard work because it's a auditing process it's not just saying, you know, we are excellent, but you really have to prove that you are excellent. And that means that all these specialties mentioned here, internal medicine, surgery, interventional radiology, and also nuclear medicine, really closely work together. And we are seeing in our center about 1,200 patient visits per year. So this is our team with the surgeons, the interventional radiologists, and the multi-talented <laughs> internal medicine doctor, which is uh, Professor Hirsch, who uh, combines in him uh, internal medicine, endocrinology, gastroenterology, and oncology. So he's specialist in all uh, these different specialities, and it's a very great pleasure to work together with him. I shortly want to explain you uh, what we call the Bart Burka concept of PRRT, of Peptide Receptor Radionuclide Therapy. The concept is, as you have seen, we are working together as a multidisciplinary team. And then we base the decision to treat a patient with PRRT on features of the tumor, if the disease is progressing, if the patient has uncontrolled symptoms, and of course one very important feature is the presence of these little magnets in the tumor cells. So the receptors must be high so that as much as possible of the substance we inject really goes to the tumor and we individualize each therapy plane in a so-called so tumor board consensus. So the patient is discussed with all his features in a round table so to say and they are sitting, the surgeon, myself as nuclear medicine, physician and molecular radiotherapists, the interventional radiologist, the oncologist, and so on. And then everybody has something to offer from his amentarium. Probably the surgeon says, he, here I am, I can treat the patient, I can operate on him. Then we all say, fine, do it. Because if you can remove the tumor, that's the best. You take it out and hopefully the problem is solved, okay? But in many, many cases, Patients come with very far progressed tumors. So not only one lesion or two or three, but 20 or 30. And then of course the surgeon is saying, stop, no, no case for me. Okay? And then we discuss what kind of tumor is it? Is it a fast growing tumor? Slowly growing tumor? What are the histological features of the tumor? And then we decide, okay, this better patient better goes to chemotherapy or to what we call molecular therapy using different drugs like sunitinib or everolimus or whatsoever. Or we decide this patient has a relatively slowly growing tumor and a lot of receptors of magnets on his tumor cell, we can treat him with PRT. If we are deciding for PRT, our concept is to, to give to the patient many cycles of therapy not only one or two with a very high activity or dose, but up to 10 we have given it to some patients. And we're using different, you know, radionuclides to treat tumors. The Y90 is a radionuclide with a strong energy. Though so these beta particles, they penetrate in the tissue around 12 millimeter. Okay? And you know, probably that one millimeter is about one million cells. So it hits many cells on his path, but
But if you would have smaller tumors, then another radionuclide like lutetium-177 with a 2 millimeter range of the beta emission would be more suitable. So it depends on the size of the tumor and on many different features how to decide. And I would also like to mention that we are injecting these therapeutic radionuclides intra-arterially. So not only in the peripheral vein, but by a catheter which you can insert in the inguinal region, you can go to the liver and inject directly, for example, into the liver or into primary tumors. This is what we call the BBS about Burka score, which just shows you, I do not want to discuss in detail with you, which just shows you what kind of features, what information you have to have available before making a decision on treatment. So it's not just like looking, oh, patient looks nice, nice image, we treat, but it's a lot more which you have to consider. And one thing I really want to discuss with you today is this FDG. I think, Bill, you asked me to discuss this issue because many patients ask why do I need, you know, two scans or so, mm. <coughs> and how it is related to the ki 67 index. Okay? So, um, our plan is, and maybe you can help us a little bit uh, on that, and Josh, you as well, to create uh, an app, you know, which any doctor can download on his iPhone or iPad or Android or whatsoever, which when you enter this data, let's say, um, blood counts. Okay, you say blood counts are normal or this patient has reduced blood counts, like reduced platelets or white blood cells or whatsoever. What's his renal function? Renal function is normal or it's reduced. What is his weight? Did he lose weight? Okay, what is his performance status and so on? So you can enter all these parameters and then you get a score and based on this score you know, oh, this patient as a high risk or as a low risk patient. It's very suitable according to our database where we have now 1100 patients with 260 items per patient over years. From that you can make, you know, just statistical conclusions what parameter is most influencing uh, or would be the most predictive for success of radionuclide therapy and so on. So that's uh, what we are thinking for the future. Though so these uh, SUVs means it's not <coughs> sports utility vehicle, okay? <laughs> also not like, like some said, silly, useless values. <laughs> but it means standardized uptake values. And I think it's very useful to use it. Uh, this just means when you, these are different patients, okay? One, two, three, four, five patients all have, as you can see here, uh, liver metastases, so the dark spots in the liver are metastases. Depending how you work on this image, they can be red or white or green or any color you might give them, okay? We still prefer for just the PET images, just the black and white. But you see these lesions are, have a very different size. These uh, seem to be quite small and they have a very high contrast. So you see nearly only the liver lesions and not very much of the normal liver. Whereas when you look here, this liver is very big, is enlarged and the lesions they are very difficult to detect. So the contrast is not very high. Okay. When you look at this patient here, you can count the lesions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight probably in the liver due to very good contrast. When you start counting here, you get lost, okay? Small lesions, but quite good contrast. And you see some patients also have uh, metastases, how we call that, outside the liver. So here is one in the leg, and actually it's in the bone. We know that from the PET CT. When you correlate this with the CT, you can say exactly where it is. 
or this is what we call a lymph node metastasis in the neck region okay and this is also lymph node metastasis here so if you ask now let's say five nuclear medicine physicians on these images what is the best patient to treat I can tell you you get five answers from people experience say always probably select these two okay because of very high contrast that means many magnets good dose to the tumor okay and probably the experience would not choose these patients because of the low contrast but in fact the best response was received in this patient which for me was quite surprising okay you have good contrast okay but it's also depending how long the radionuclide stays in the cell and this patient had originally a neuroendocrine tumor arising from his right kidney that's why he has only one kidney so they had taken out the kidney unfortunately they shouldn't have done this but they've taken out the kidney with the primary tumor and this patient had a twice as long half-life residence time in the tumor as compared to other patients and responded very well okay so these SUVs or standardized uptake values can be very different in different tumors for example if you look at primary tumors let's say the normal liver would have a SUV of five normal tissue okay or the normal lung would have a SUV of one just to give you a number then you see that primary tumors uh, have between 1.5 to 20 times the amount of activity in the liver or 100 times the amount in the lung okay so very good contrast that means you give a lot radiation to the tumor and you save you spare normal tissue from radiation liver metastasis up to 156 and lymph nodes up to 152 so if you have such a high uptake it predicts that all the therapy will work very well so we have done a study to look if this is really correct if we measure with a PET CT scanner these SUVs is it really corresponding to the number of magnets in the little tumor cells and to make a long story short we imaged patients before therapy uh, before resection of their tumor by the surgeon you see here for example a tumor in the small bowel then the patient the surgeon has resected the tumor and you can see here the small tumor which was in this case just four millimeter in size in the small bowel had been removed and then by the pathologist we can stain the tissue and look if the little magnets the receptors are present in this tumor and how is the density of these little magnets in the tumor and what we found is that there was a very good correlation by the PET CT results and the immunohistochemistry so we really can predict without opening the patient without opening your body without you know putting uh, probes or something in it we can predict non-invasively if the tumor has certain properties and that is theranostics okay you can by a non-invasive imaging <coughs> you can look at tissues at different abilities and properties of tissues and predict if your target for example is there now the role of FDG PET CT why would I need two different PET CTs one gallium 68 and the other called glucose PET first let me say that PET and PET CT is just a device is an imaging machine but very different from a CT scanner where you always use the same contrast medium 
for PET CT, we have many, many different radiopharmaceuticals, many different contrast agents. So we can not look only at anatomy, at the size of a tumor, uh, or where is it located, but we can look at what we call metabolism of the tumor. How much sugar is a tumor eating? How much amino acids a tumor is using? What is the perfusion of the tumor? What antigens are there? What receptors? And so on. Okay? Is there hypoxia in the tumor? We <coughs> even can use nowadays small probes to target genes in the tumor. So we can even predict if there are certain genes present in the tumor without taking any biopsy, just by a PET CT. So you understand the PET CT is like, uh, like if you say there is a car, but there is not one model of the car, there are hundreds of models of the car. So nowadays we have in use, in clinical use, we have over 50 different probes which we can use in a PET scanner, some for looking at the brain, function at Alzheimer's disease, for example, or Parkinson, some for looking at the heart, some for looking at tumors. And we are dealing, of course, mainly with tumors in this talk today, but there are many, many different functions. And aside from that, there are many different radioisotopes which we can link to our probes. So very short-lived ones, like C11, for example, uh, but this must be all produced in a cyclotron. Whereas this little gallium generator, which has the size of a refrigerator, okay, can give you the same thing at lower cost. So what is FDG? FDG actually is 2-deoxy-2-fluorodeglucose. Okay, this is shortened to FDG. And FDG is exactly the same what you have taken this morning for breakfast, and probably put it in your coffee, on Josh, you don't like sugar in the coffee, I know that, okay? But it is also carbohydrates are sugars, okay? So what everyone eats uh, today is glucose, and this FDG molecule is just different from glucose by that, that in the so-called position two, that is here, one group of oxygen and hydrogen, uh, OH group, has been replaced by fluoride and then radioactive fluoride. So again, we can detect it from outside by the PET scanner. Now, this is a German slide, but intentionally I sorted this slide in German because it was a German, namely Otto Warburg, who detected already in 1925 that two more have an increased demand of glucose. So tumors like sugar, say eat sugar, and burn it for what we call creating molecules of energy, this ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and tumors produce two mole of ATP per mole glucose. And he was the one who detected that. And we know nowadays that Tumor cells have these glucose transporters which shuffle, you know, the glucose into the cell and then certain enzymes are using the glucose and creating energy for the tumor cell. <coughs> and Otto Warburg, by the way, received the Nobel Prize uh, for this detection. And labeled with uh, F18, sugar is injected into the blood of a patient and then is taken up by these transporters in the cell surface and metabolized by an enzyme which is called hexokinase to uh, FDG1 phosphate. And then the other enzymes in the tumor cell recognize that this is not sugar. This is something different from sugar and it sticks into the cell. It is what we call trapped into a tumor cell. Okay? Whereas normal cells throw it out because it's useless. Okay. So malignant, rapidly growing tumor cells typically have glucose burning rates or glycolytic rates 
that are up to 200 times higher than those of normal tissues. And this occurs even if oxygen, oxygen is there plentiful. So Wabro postulated that this change in metabolism is a fundamental cause of cancer. He thought he now found why are tumor cells growing, which is a Warburg hypothesis. It's still true today that we now know much better which genes are involved in, you know, um, creating this mechanism for the cancer cell. And we know also that these cancer cells predominantly produce energy by glycolysis, which is much less efficient than in normal cells, but they still insist on burning this glucose by glycolysis, and they bypass what we call the mitochondria. The mitochondria are like little powerhouses in the cell. You know, they create energy. And tumor cells bypass this mitochondria and burn it in a quite inefficient way, but this makes them resistant to many attacks from outside. For example, the tumor cell love acidity. And this acid environment, you know, protects the tumor cell from immune attacks, for example. Or it also, you know, ensures that radiation is not working as efficient and as in tumor cells which have a lot of oxygen, and so on and so on. We can also show that FDG PET can predict responses by therapy. And one of the drug which was used here, which is mentioned here, uh, is, for example, Zutent, which is also used in neuroendocrine treatment. And you see that in this patient with a lot of hypermetabolic liver metastases, after the drug was used, there is much less uptake. So again, we can quantitate that. Also, we know that FDG is very closely correlated to PI67. Okay? PI67 actually is a proliferation marker of the tumor cell. So if you look at this tissue here, this histology, and you try to count the cells which are positive for this, what we call immunohistostaining, less than 5% of the cells are in a division phase or dividing, whereas here the ki 67 is 30%. So in neuroendocrine tumors, this is also used to define the grade of a tumor. If the tumor has very little proliferation, that means ki 67 is low, we speak about a highly differentiated tumor, which usually also have a lot of receptors, whereas when the count is more than 20%, we speak about a poorly or G3 differentiated tumor, and these tumors tend to grow much faster, to be more aggressive, to take up more glucose, and to have less receptors. This is one example of what we call a flip flop phenomenon. If you look at the one side, the FDG pet with its positive metastasis in the liver, and on the other side, the gallium scan, which shows only very faint uptake in areas where FDG is negative, we can predict, again, serenostics, we can predict by these two scans, this patient will not respond to PRT, because our magnets the receptors are not there in the metastasis, whereas there are many lesions which are receptor negative and rapidly growing. We were dealing with this issue already more than 14 years ago. In 1998, we published a paper on metabolic PET and receptor SPEC at this time in neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, we recognized that it is related to PI67 expression. We also um, published uh, a paper and did some research um, on correlating gallium 68 receptor PET and FDG PET. And this is another 
nice example where you see when you compare the FDG PET with the indium octreotide uh, scan or with the gallium dodatate PET CT, you see in the one patient the lesions in the liver are what we call hypermetabolic, they eat glucose, and the receptors are very little. But in the other patient, the FDG is negative, but very, very high uptake by the gallium labeled peptides. So this patient would be a patient very suitable for peptide therapy. This patient would be transferred um, to uh, chemotherapy. This is uh, another nice example showing you uh, here a gallium dodatate PET CT in a patient with liver metastases and the FDG PET where only one single lesion here in the liver is FDG positive. That means we do not speak about one tumor but we are speaking about different tumors. We name this heterogeneity. Tumors are not all the same they do not have all the same color, but they have different colors, like different cars, right? So the one is racing and the other is, you know, driving very slowly. So to make uh, the, the thing a little bit more easier for you, we have developed a test which is based on the transcatalyzed enzyme or TKTL1 gene, which is strongly upregulated in cancers which eat glucose. And we have developed a test where we can measure this activity in blood. So probably in future we will not need any more in all patients FDG PET, but we can predict by a blood test if the tumor will eat glucose or not. To make it uh, simple I have written here, as more glucose a cancer cell is using, as higher is the malignant potential and as poorer the prognosis. Positive FDG PET is in fact negative for you as patients, which means you have a poor outcome if you have a lot of FDG positive tumors. And this is a publication uh, which came out in uh, November last year in 2012. Uh, on this uh, ADIM TKTL1 blood test, a non-invasive method to detect upregulated glucose metabolism in patients with malignancies. Okay, so we found that this test can really predict if the patient has FDG positive tumors and that it also correlated with the malignancy of the tumors. Um, I want to make a switch to this slide, which I have uh, borrowed from Marion de Jong actually, and which was published uh, in Nature some time ago. Um, and this I think is a very, very important image, because we are doing a lot of research, and on the one hand is the researcher, and on the other end of, the, of this tower uh, is a clinician who wants to use what is developed in the preclinical phase and unfortunately here in this image the patient is in the valley of death. That means if these two do not speak which, with each other, if this not translates into the clinic from bench to bedside, then the patient can take no profit. And our aim in Bad Berka with this Seronostic Research Center is to combine different preclinical methods, like for example animal imaging, which we do in collaboration with uh, other colleagues, or molecular pathology, which is applied in our hospital, as well as molecular imaging and molecular therapy. And if all this work together, we can have a greater benefit for the patient. So this is, uh, so to say, my last slide of the talk, because I do not want to make it too long, but it is uh, probably the most important slide of my lecture, because it is entitled From Tissue 
to molecular imaging to therapy on the way to personalized medicine. And as I have shown you, the first step is to take tissue from the patient, okay? Then to characterize this tissue, different magnets and substances in the tumor tissue, and then decide what use for imaging for the PET-CT or for therapy for the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So we can say that PRT is effective even for very advanced cases. We have a median overall survival based on uh, prospective uh, evaluation of 415 patients from start of treatment of 59 months, so nearly five years. And PRT leads to significant improvement also of clinical symptoms. Cure is rarely possible if you have a very heavily metastasized tumor, but excellent palliation can be achieved. And uh, in progressive neuroendocrine tumors, the use of yttrium 90 and lutetium-177 in combination is most efficient. Um, I have not spoken about uh, adverse effects today because uh, you asked for this FTG uh, explanation, which took uh, some while. Um, but we can avoid kidney damage by giving substances which protect the kidney, like uh, amino acids. And uh, we have uh, administered actually up to 10 courses uh, over several years in some patients without uh, really damaging the kidney. And as I stressed already at the beginning of my talk, interdisciplinary treatment is really needed because uh, these are relatively rare tumors and you need really experience and uh, experienced team to treat these tumors. So I want to like to thank my team, the radiochemists, the nurses, the doctors, the medical physics and so on. And of course, whoops, it went a little bit fast. I want to thank also you as patients because uh, by discussion with you as patients, actually for me personally that is completely true. I found sometimes really new ways and uh, new ways to think about a tumor and about the disease. And also sometimes I got really new ideas how to attack this uh, terrible cancers. So we are small but we are very focused and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard, for an insightful presentation.